This is the tenth and last in a sermon series called The Greatest of These about St. Paul's famous pay on to love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. For now we know only in part, but then we shall know fully, even as we are fully known. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I reasoned as a child, but when I became an adult, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now we know only in part, then we will know fully, even as we are fully known. Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the film Love Actually, Liam Neeson's 10-year-old little geeky stepson, Sam, is having a horrible semester at his school in London. First, his mother dies, and then he somehow manages to fall in love with the most beautiful and popular and talented girl in the class, who, of course, does not know he exists. And Sam doesn't quite know how to handle this problem, so he shambles about the house for a couple of weeks in a deep black funk. And his clueless and broken-hearted stepfather, Liam Neeson, who's also lost his wife, doesn't know how to help. He thinks Sam may be grieving his lost mother, but in fact, love is a lot worse than death. And finally, Liam Neeson asks his stepson what's wrong. And Sam says, do you really want to know? And Liam Neeson says, yes, I really want to know. And Sam says, even though there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And Liam Neeson says, yes, even if there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. And Sam says, well, the fact is I'm in love. And there's a visible look of relief on Liam Neeson's face. An audible sigh of reprieve. And he says, well, I guess I'm a little relieved. And Sam says, relieved? Why? And Liam Neeson says, well, I thought it might be something a lot worse. And Sam says, what's worse than the total agony of hopeless love? And there's a pause. And fi finally, Liam Neeson says, well, yes, I see your point. Later in the film, the boy and his stepfather will decide to pursue this hopeless love even in the face of almost certainty that it will be totally futile. And Liam Neeson says, come on, let's go get the crap kicked out of us by love. And they do. Joan Crawford says that love is a fire, but whether it will warm your heart or burn your house down, it's sometimes hard to tell. It is our greatest joy and sometimes our greatest regret it is our greatest meaning, our greatest goal, our greatest purpose. It is what we crave most to get out of life. We may have the whole world, but if we don't have love, we are nothing. And St. Paul knows this, so in 1 Corinthians 13, he dissects the common concept of love into its constituent parts to tell us why it's the greatest gift in the world. And he says love is patient. He says love is kind. He says love is never envious or boastful or arrogant and rude, but he saves the best for the last. He says love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. More than anything else, says St. Paul, love is so precious because it is immortal. Paul's famous paean to love in 1 Corinthians 13 is 13 verses long. 296 words, but you can sum it up in three short, simple, monosyllabic English words. Love is long. True love is indestructible. True love is imperishable. I tell my brides and grooms, illness can't defeat love. New infatuations can't defeat love. Diverging career paths can't defeat love. Even your partner's maddening idiosyncrasies can't defeat love. Love is longer than life itself and strong as death. The Song of Songs in the Hebrew Bible says love is beautiful as fire and strong as death. 
Yes, beautiful as fire and strong as death. Maury Schwartz says, death ends a life, not a relationship. We do not stop loving her when we lose her to the grave. She is with us still and always will be. On Veterans Day weekend, I have to mention the most beautiful love letter a soldier has ever written home to his beloved. Sullivan Ballou served with the Rhode Island Militia and the Union Army during the Civil War. He wrote several letters home to his beloved wife, Sarah, including this one from July 14, 1861. My dearest Sarah, if I should fail to return to you, realize how much I have loved you. And when my last breath escapes my body and the battlefield, it will whisper your name. And if the dead can ever come home to flit about unseen among those they love, realize that I will always be with you in the gladdest day and in the darkest night, always, always. And if there be a soft breeze upon your cheek, it shall be my breath. As the coolness fans your throbbing temple, realize that my spirit is passing by. Dearest Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Just think me gone and waiting for you, for we shall meet again. Sarah never received that letter, or at least not till much later, because Judge Advocate Ballou was killed in the Battle of Bull Run on July 21, 1861, seven days after he wrote that letter. It was found among his personal belongings when they retrieved his body from the battlefield days later. Sullivan was 32, and Sarah was 24. They'd been married for six years and had two little boys. They're buried together in a cemetery in Providence, Rhode Island. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Just think me gone and waiting for you. Now we know only in part, says St. Paul. Then we shall know fully, even as we are fully known. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. That's an unexpected image, isn't it? Why does Paul start talking about mirrors in this context? Well, that's a good question, and I have a good answer. You see, in the first century, the city of Corinth was known for its superior mirrors. In the Roman Empire, Corinth was to mirrors what Detroit is to cars and New York to books and Hollywood to movies. It was the mirror capital of the empire. But you also know that in the first century, their mirrors were far inferior to the ones we use. So the black-backed pieces of glass that do such a beautiful job of reflecting images for us Did you know they were only invented in 1835, less than 200 years ago? For thousands of years, mirrors were always hammered, polished discs of bronze or some other metal, and they reflected back a wavy, or as Paul puts it, a dim reflection. They were uh, poor facsimiles of the original. You couldn't really know a person's face by looking at his reflection in a mirror which is a shame because we all want to be seen, right? We all want to be known. We all want to be loved for who we are. David Brooks writes about an epidemic of invisibility that's going on in America just now, an epidemic of invisibility. David Brooks says he interviews many people who feel unseen by their fellow Americans. Black Americans feel invisible to white Americans. And rural Americans feel invisible to coastal elites. And this diminishes us. This makes us feel small. And Paul knows about an epidemic of invisibility in this imperfect world of uncertain knowledge and dim reflections. And so he promises us that our life in the world to come will be so much different and fuller and happier because we will be seen by God through this lens of grace. God will know us and see us and love us despite our flaws and our failings. And we will see each other fully, face to face. No more dim reflections. Is anybody uh, reading Ann Patchett's new novel, Tom Lake? Number seven on the Times bestseller list this morning. Tom Lake, I can't believe I get to live in a world 
where I can read a book like this. It's like she wrote this book just for me. It's set in, get this, it's set in a cherry orchard during the cherry harvest near Petoskey, Michigan, just across Grand Traverse Bay from where I spend my summers in Northport. And the, act, uh, the characters, get this, they're all middle-aged when the story takes place, but they all met when they were in their 20s performing in a production of Stones and Wild Lou, Our Town. Perfect book. They all play George and Emily and the stage manager. This is the way we were in the provinces north of New York at the beginning of the 20th century. This is the way we were in our growing up and in our marrying, in our living and in our dying. Oh, mama, would you just look at me as if you see me? Emily wants to be seen. Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful. Does anybody realize how wonderful you are while they're alive every, every minute? Now, where did Ann Patch get the idea to set a novel about our town actors in a cherry orchard in northern Michigan? Well, that's a good question, and I have a good answer. In 2001, Ann Patchett was touring the country promoting her book, Bel Canto, and her publisher wanted her to do a reading and signing at a bookstore in Petoskey, Michigan. And Miss Patchett simply didn't want to go. It would mean that she would have to fly to Detroit from wherever she was and then hop a, f a commuter flight to Traverse City and then rent a car and drive two hours north to Petoskey. She didn't want to do this. And then she arrived in Petoskey at this bookstore called McLean and Eakins, and she changed her mind. Ann Patchett says McLean and Eakins is the most charming bookstore in America. And it inspired Ann, who lives in Nashville, to start her own bookstore back home. And so when Miss Patchett was done with her signing and her reading at the bookstore, she toured these cherry orchards up there and loved them so much that she and her husband have been coming up there every summer for 20 years. The main character, Lara, is taking a walk through her orchard with her hapless rescue mutt, Hazel. And they end up in the orchard's cemetery and this orchard is on the best plot of ground on the entire farm. It's way up high, the best plot of ground. It overlooks the trees and the barns and even has a distant view of the lake. It's the perfect place for the main farmhouse on this farm. But no, these early settlers reserved their best plot of ground for their dead. The first, a two-year-old named Mary, and then one by one, they followed her up the hill until there are 29 of them resting beneath, beneath those mossy slabs, waiting there for us to join them. That's the way it was back in the day. You buried your children and your husband and your parents right there on the farm with you because that's the only place they've ever been. It's the only place they ever wanted to be. There they wait for us to join them because death ends a life, not a relationship. Love is long. Love is immortal. There's not much else to say. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these 